We want to begin our conversation today by reflecting on some of your family's amazing legacy. The words that your uncle delivered 60 years ago in his famous I Have a Dream speech have just impacted us all. It's a, he said so many amazing things, but we just wondered, is there a personal story that you can share about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.? Absolutely. I did not attend the march. I was a young teenager, and we remained at home. I did go to a march that same year called the Children's March uh, in Birmingham, Alabama. My parents did journey to you know, join their brother and brother-in-law at the march. There are so many things that my uncle said and did, but one of the most impressive things he said to me, as I think back, he says, I have a dream that one day there'll be no black power, no white power, mm. only God power and human power. And I think about my grandfather, Reverend Martin Luther King Sr., my dad, Reverend Alfred Daniel Williams King, A.D. King, and they often talk about us all being one blood and one human race of one blood, God made all people. So when I think about my uncle, his inclusiveness, uh, he embraced diversity and all, all of that from a Christian perspective. So that led him to say, we must learn to live together as brothers and I'll add as sisters and not perish together as fools. So he saw everybody with ethnicity. He wasn't colorblind, none of us are colorblind. We, we celebrate ethnicity but we don't fight over skin color. So I think that's one of the things that are so that remains with me and is so remarkable to me, that understanding that I've carried through my lifetime and now I'm 73. Hmm. Wow, yeah, that's, that's powerful that we're all one blood, one race created by God, all with equal dignity and all sacred in, uh, in his yeah. eyes. Uh, Dr. King, most Americans obviously know a lot about your uncle, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., uh, but they may not know as much about your, your father, who you just referenced, Alfred Daniel King, a Reverend A.D. King, um, who was also a civil rights uh, movement uh, leader and, and hero himself. In fact, he was such a threat to the white supremacists of his day that when you were just 12 years old, they actually they bombed your family's home. Can you tell us about that experience and the uh, the heroic and amazing way in which your father responded? I remember often Daddy standing on a car out in front of our home. We escaped when the house was bombed. My mother, Mrs. Naomi Ruth Barber King, talks about that, and I do too. And you can find videos and YouTubes of her description of what happened. And so we escaped out of the home, and my father stood on a car with, I don't know if he had a megaphone that night, but he spoke to the crowd and he says, listen, don't riot and don't fight. If you have to hit someone, hit me, but I'd rather you go home and pray. My family and I are okay. And what we had was what was called the outside agitators. And you see that today in this century. A lot of times when you see these riots and firebombs and people throwing bricks through cars, it's not the residents, it's not the people of that who live there, but these are people who come in from other communities and places to stir up agitation. And so the people, when, what I remember from that particular night, the people who lived in the neighborhood started going home. And so you were left with these rioters and outside agitators who really were not even part of our community. I remember that. That was a great preacher, too. I posted recently on YouTube, and I think I said Alveda King... A.D. King sermon, and people, when they listened to Daddy's voice, they said, that sounds stuff just like Martin Luther King Jr., <laughs> and they looked alike. They were very much, very similar in appearance, and they were very, very close. So Daddy was a Baptist preacher just like his brother. He was a civil rights leader, a father, a husband, and uh, we miss all of them so much now. Hmm. Well, that was just such a powerful story of your father responding not in anger or hatred, but trying to quell anger and hatred um, when his own family was viciously and violently attacked. It, he did, it didn't just show courage, it showed moral courage, um, which was it's, it's just so powerful. So th thank you for sharing that story. 
Um, I'd like to ask you uh, if, if you don't mind, Dr. King, we've made a lot of progress towards uh, achieving a lot of the goals of the civil rights movement that your father and, and your uncle and others in your family uh, so valiantly fought for. Um, yet we're uh, experiencing an increasing tension, racial tensions today. You just kind of referenced it in uh, just a few moments ago about those outside agitators in that particular instance. There are a lot of uh, folks out there who are trying to stoke the fires of hatred and bitterness between uh, between white people and black people, which were the very fires that your father and others so valiantly fought to quell. Um, can you share with us any thoughts you may have on how we can all stand together in working to heal those racial grievances and promote racial reconciliation? Victory absolutely must be maintained in every generation, in every decade, and on every platform. And we all often wonder, why are the young people acting like that? Why do they do that? Why do they say that? If we do not proclaim truth in every generation, every decade, and on every platform, people forget. And so we must come together and stand together. And I'm often saying that to young people and people my age and older than me. If we do not stand up for justice and righteousness, then we Wickedness and evil and terror will overtake us. So people will often say, oh, we are going backwards. We've lost everything that Martin Luther King Jr. fought for. Absolutely not. We certainly not lost everything that Jesus Christ won on the cross at Calvary. But it is our responsibility in every generation, every decade, every platform to proclaim truth and to explain truth. And that's why I'll give you a good example. Remember when the CRT, critical race theory argument, was just just so loud all across the country, and then people started saying, well, we will cancel CRT. We won't talk about it. I said, well, no. Let, I called you bluff on that one. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about critical race theory, being socialist, being Marxist, having been created by people who thought that oh, there were different races and there was a superior race based on blonde hair and blue eyes. And I say, so socialism and Marxism is not fair. It's not just. And critical race theory was birthed out of that, that philosophy. So when we started doing that, you notice that the, the advocates of CRT, oh, well, we never said that, and we really didn't mean it, and we didn't do it. I said, so uh, my point is this, tell the truth and shame the devil. And so America has such a rich and beautiful, wonderful history. It has some very terrible, ugly, mean things, but it has some absolutely wonderful experiences. So when you take that and tell the whole story, for instance, a lot of people really didn't believe that there were black people who owned slaves, who owned black slaves in America. People did not want to believe that. Another thing that people did not want to believe was that in the time that slavery occurred here in America, when the Caucasians went over to get the slaves, the slaves were sold to the Caucasians by black people. 